promoting a healthy environment. It's the air we breathe. Clean, safe water. Responsible management of our natural resources. We protect and restore for a sustainable future. Environment matters. I think that's a, an exciting thing. You know, as you can see here, you know, with thousands of acres here that's been restored, you know, to have the upper population here for people to come and enjoy. Meet some of the state's newest residents, two dozen elk that will soon call this reclaimed surface mine in southern West Virginia home. Plus, when you make a, a systemic change to a building process, you know, naturally you hope it's for the right reason and, for the, and it turns out well. And in this particular instance, it's turned out very well. Huntington Area Habitat for Humanity takes affordable housing in a more sustainable direction by building Energy Star into the equation. Hello everyone and welcome to another edition of Environment Matters. I'm Greg Adolphson. And I'm Kelly Gillenwater. But first, a fire in an abandoned underground mine in Preston County has area residents concerned and the DEP's Division of Abandoned Mine Lands and Reclamation working on a solution. The DEP's Jake Glantz joins us now with more. Well, Greg and Kelly, it's not often that you'll hear a fire compared to an iceberg, but like an iceberg, most of what makes these abandoned mine fires dangerous is hidden deep below the surface. The air is thick with the smell of coal smoke. It swirls up from below, through cracks in the earth, and mixes with a steady cold rain. The fog it forms drifts over and partially obscures the blackened stumps of this once green hillside. But it's what inspectors and engineers can't see that's causing concern. The mine fire has grown uh, at a rate that isn't common with your typical mine fire. The, uh, the fire itself has, has increased um, exponentially over the past uh, year. And so that's not something that we typically see with mine fires. Oftentimes they will smoke and produce some flames, but not to the degree that we've seen at Broken Run. The site is called Broken Run, but little else is known about the abandoned mine works that run beneath the mountain. We have no mine maps for the site. We have no information from the Geologic Survey or the uh, West Virginia Miners Health and Safety. We, we, we don't know anything about the, um, the mine as it, as it occurred prior to 1977. So we're, we're going off the physical features that remain at the site. If we had mine maps, we'd have some idea as to what direction the fire may travel. And it would absolutely help out with our abatement plan if we knew where, where the uh, passages within the mine complex existed. Crews have already drilled several boreholes, probing the mountain to try and determine the extent of the fire. One thing they know for sure, it's hot, extremely hot. So the temperatures that we've encountered at this particular site are so high that we can't get accurate readings. Um, we know they exceed 1,000 degrees in some of the hotter areas, but to tell you exactly how hot they are, um, we don't know because the, uh, the heat is so intense it, it's giving us false readings on the instruments. Fighting fires in an underground coal seam is nothing like fighting a fire on the surface. For one thing, you can't use water. You can't put water on coal refuse fires and, and we can't pump water down into the mine complex because the temperatures are so extreme. Um, you can cause a steam explosion. The last thing you want to do is to start pumping water into the fire itself because you, you can actually cause more damage than, than you intend uh, due to the possibility of a steam explosion. If conditions uh, allow, what we like to do is to actually excavate the burning material, take that material off-site, spread it out, and, and then try to put the, the burning material out in small increments until we can accomplish the, uh, the overall project. That's what crews did here in Boone County last year at this coal refuse pile fire and the previous year in Whitehall in Marion County, the two most recent emergency mine fire projects handled by the DEP. In those cases, as with Broken Run, the Federal Office of Surface Mining, Remediation and Enforcement allowed the DEP to use emergency procedures to address the problem. OSM doesn't typically allow us to include mine fires in the inventory, and that's because of the cost associated with abating them. 
So right now the state has almost a billion dollars worth of mine fires that we know of uh, which are not included in the National Abandoned Mine Land Inventory. So only when a fire becomes uh, problematic enough to where you have a structure or uh, citizens that are at risk will OSM allow us to go in and fund that particular project. So the fires we've done over the past few years have been situations where if we didn't act, um, there was potential for someone to lose uh, their home. But conditions at Broken Run are different from those other two fires. We've drilled the site and we found that the, the coal pavement or the bottom of the coal seam is approximately uh, 80 feet below the surface. And that varies depending on where at on the hill you are, but on average it's approximately 80 feet. And that's really the problem that we face in this particular situation. The, the overall mine complex that could be on fire, uh, we, we feel is close to uh, 60 acres. Right now there's approximately 15 acres that are on fire. We've identified two areas that we feel we can um, create grout curtains or cut off trenches to prevent the fire from migrating to those other two areas, um, approximately 20 acres in size, e e each one, each section. And so what we hope is to be able to contain the fire within a, a 20 acre area. Um, given the, the rock strata above the coal and the fact that we've got about 80 feet of that rock above the coal, uh, doing a, an, a, um, an extraction and a removal of the coal isn't feasible. Um, we, we'd be looking at tens of millions of dollars to do that. The best way to visualize what's happening underground at the site is to imagine a wood stove with a damper in the bottom to let air in and a chimney at the top to vent out heat and smoke. At Broken Run, that's an outcrop of the coal seam. And so what we found, the holes around the outcrop are actually pulling air into the mine fire and through cracks and vents on the top of the mountain, the smoke is exiting. And that's part of the reason why the fire has intensified as much as it has in as short of a period of time. Uh, as we've seen. So our, our first phase is going to be to go in and close off all the openings to the coal. Now once we do that and, and we've got the fire um, somewhat contained, the second phase will be to go in and ensure or create cutoff trenches or grout curtains to prevent the fire to migrate uh, into workings that haven't burned yet. That first phase is estimated to cost around $180,000. We don't know what any subsequent phases will cost until we know for sure what we're going to do. Um, a few of the, the ideas that we've discussed and, and some of the plans our engineers are looking at are either creating a, an open trench to sever the burning fuel from the fuel that hasn't caught on fire yet or using a grout curtain to try to prevent the fire from migrating um, in, into unburned areas. So. Once they, once engineers do what they do and, and, and run their calculations, come up with yardages and whatnot, uh, then we'll sit down and take a look at um, not just the cost of the project and um, how effective those potential fixes will be, but we also have to look at our budget because I, our budgets have been cut drastically over the past five years. Uh, this particular project is going to present a, a budgetary problem for our office, um, given the fact that we know it's going to be a multi-million dollar project. And just the tip of a potentially billion dollar iceberg. Work to begin addressing the fire at Broken Run is expected to begin in January and because all of AML's funding is currently budgeted for other projects, Rice and his staff must assess their other planned projects to determine which can be delayed to fund this project. For Environment Matters, I'm Jake Glantz. Thanks, Jake. We'll continue to follow this developing story in upcoming editions of Environment Matters. Building affordable housing for families who couldn't otherwise afford to take on the financial commitment of homeownership is the mission of Habitat for Humanity. And to help cut the cost of ownership over the long haul, the Huntington Area Chapter is building its houses to Energy Star specifications. Sustainable housing for us took started taking hold for us in about 2008 when we started making some minor changes to the to our standard building procedures that we um, had in place we had been building just a regular code built house we just wanted to take the next step in the process and try to work our way through that 
as cost effectively as we could. That involved framing with 2x6 lumber instead of 2x4, which allows about 57% more insulation to be placed inside a wall that combined with additional caulking and spray foam created a more airtight building envelope. So we were already building a really good product. We just wanted to make it that much better for our home buyers, um, keep our houses affordable in the long term. You know, when you, when you make a, a systemic change to a building process, you know, naturally you hope it's for the right reason and, for the, and it turns out well. And in this particular instance, it's turned out very well. We have home buyers that are now paying, um, you know, on average about a $350 per month payment to us for their house, which is very affordable. But when you couple that with an Energy Star certified house that's very energy efficient, it's all electric, and their electric bill runs between 75 and 120 dollars per month. Uh, so it's that kind of long-term affordability that we're looking at and keeping our houses in that affordability range for our home buyers. And those aren't the only improvements done during the construction phase. Actually there are two other main components that that we've incorporated. One is called a condition crawl space and that is um, you know all of our houses we don't do slab on grade. Um, our building lots tend not to lend to that type of construction. Uh, just because of the topography and the terrain. So we do a condition crawl space and for us that means we have um, two inch uh, blue board foam insulation that we line the insides of our block foundation and whenever all the construction is nearing completion we put our, our moisture barrier in and it's taped to that two inch foam that's around the um, inside of the foundation then the only penetration through that is the actual access door where you can actually get under your house if you had a, you know, a water leak or you needed to go under there for some reason just to check something out. It's sealed very tightly. It's not perfect, but it's sealed really tight. Um, so any, the object of that is any air that escapes the, the ductwork, whether it's heated or cooled, stays within the envelope of the house. Uh, the other big change that we made about the same time we went to the condition crawl space was the uh, raised heel truss. And that allows the same 12 inches of insulation that we put in the center of a ceiling of a house to go all the way out to the top plate on all four exterior walls. So that same 12 inches of insulation goes from top plate to top plate on the sides, top plate to top plate, front to back and that's the same thickness throughout the entire ceiling area of that house. So we end up with about an R38, R40 in the ceiling. Uh, our walls are rated at about an R23-ish, somewhere in that neighborhood. So they're very, very well insulated, um, very minimal air infiltration through penetrations of any sort. Um, like I said earlier, we've invested a lot into uh, extra caulking extra uh, expandable foam insulation just to fill in those holes and gaps just to make sure that that is an airtight or as tight as we can get it uh, system for that house. Huntington Area Habitat for Humanity also has a program that works with the local VA Medical Center to help get homeless vets off the streets and into homes of their own. We'll hear more about that program in an upcoming edition of Environment Matters. After the presents have all been opened and the decorations put away for another year, all that's left to do is figure out what to do with the tree. And in one local community, the answer is recycle it. The DEP's Brianna Hickman joins us now with the details. Greg and Kelly, for folks living in Marion County who prefer a live Christmas tree, it's as easy as picking up the phone and saying, come pick it up. It's easy without all the lights and decorations to mistake this for an ordinary row of evergreens, but these were all once Christmas trees in homes all around Marion County. Marion County Parks and Recreation partners with a local nursery to allow residents to purchase a live tree and then, after the holidays, donate it to be planted in one of eight parks around the county. The program has been going strong for more than 20 years. This program enables you to come purchase that bald and burlap tree and the park will come to your house and we'll put that Christmas tree in your house wherever you'd like to have it in your house. We also provide a, a basin for it too, a nice metal basin that we'll provide and instructions on how to take care of that tree. Um, and then after Christmas you give us a call and say hey, we're done with the tree. Our guys will come pick up that tree and we'll come plant it at one of our local parks. It's a popular program, one with a lot of repeat business. 
A lot of people come back every year since the program has started. There's been at least five that have came back and told me about how easier the program makes their lives and um, they do a lot of showing of their houses. They decorate them and then the parks come and take it and it makes them a lot easier because um, bald and burlap trees, depending on how large your tree is, they can get very heavy at times. So it's kind of hard for older people to um, lift the trees and get them in their house. On average, 20 to 30 families take advantage of the program and over the years, that adds up to hundreds of trees. Oh yeah, it's been very successful, it's been well received. We have a lot of people that come back year after year. Uh, we have people, like I said, that, that don't have the means to get that tree into their house, that uh, enjoy our guys coming over and putting it and placing it for them and all that too. And uh, we probably have, you know, a good uh, dozen or so repeat customers that come every year. And then we also donate some trees to some local uh, businesses. Um, and the Historical Society uh, and 612 Mac Community Center. And then after Christmas, we'll go pick those up and then we'll plant those in the park too. And something I always like to tell the families, if you would like, we could flag that tree and mark it so you'll know where that tree's planted at the park. So you can come back 20, 30 years from now and say, well, there's our Christmas tree from 2016. They're growing at the park too. So that's a nice little added feature for everybody. The program has been in place since the early 1990s, so some of these replanted Christmas trees are 70 feet tall or more now. About 400 donated former Christmas trees have been placed in various Marion County parks since the program began. For Environment Matters, I'm Brianna Hickman. Thanks, Brianna. For folks who prefer a cut tree, the DEP partners with the West Virginia Division of Natural Resources to collect the trees and place them in lakes around the state like Summersville, East Lynn, and Stonewall Jackson to serve as fish habitat. The collection takes place in Charleston in early January. 28 different groups will share $1.8 million in REAP recycling grants. The grants were awarded recently to various municipalities, county commissions, solid waste authorities, private industries, and nonprofit groups at a ceremony at DEP headquarters in Charleston. One of the groups was the Cabell County Solid Waste Authority. The, the REAP grant is extremely important. I, I don't think I could put into words how important it is to our Solid Waste Authority here in Cabell County. Um, you know, we've got a population pushing 100,000 people in this, in this county that probably balloons to well over 150,000 on the course of a regular work day. So we have a lot of people that are around this general metro area. So that, that grant money means that we will have some form of recycling that's going to continue on into the, into the future. So, you know, for us, you know, the news about the REAP grant is, is astounding. And, and honestly, it's actually a, a, a feeling of relief that we are going to maintain some sort of recycling in Cabell County because it's not right to have a county this size and a population this big and not have recycling as an option, you know, some sort of sustainable option to, to you know, for, for people that live in this area. Cabell County received just over $147,000. The grant will go to help with wages, fuel maintenance, and the purchase of recycling trailers, vertical balers, a forklift, pallet jacks, floor scales, other supplies, and also to fund public outreach for the countywide recycling program. For the second year in a row, Berkeley County has been selected by the DEP's REAP program as the 2016 Clean County Award recipient. As the award winner, the Berkeley County Solid Waste Authority will receive $2,000 to apply toward cleanups and other environmental projects. Five municipalities were also recognized as clean communities. Each municipality will receive two road signs designating it as a clean community. Both sets of awards are presented annually. This year's Clean Community winners are the Village of Beach Bottom in Brook County, the Town of Fayetteville in Fayette County, the Town of Wardensville in Hardy County, the Town of Nutter Fort in Harrison County, and the Grand Prize winner, the City of New Cumberland in Hancock County. As the Clean Community Grand Prize winner, New Cumberland will also receive $500 to apply toward additional cleanup and beautification projects. Winning County Solid Waste Authorities are honored for their efforts promoting environmental stewardship through cleanups, outreach, and law enforcement. Clean Community Awards are in recognition of cleanup, recycling, youth participation, and beautification projects. It's a homecoming nearly a century and a half in the making. Herds of elk, once plentiful throughout West Virginia, were hunted down to the last elk in the state in the late 1870s. 
But elk are making a comeback thanks to a program to repopulate the herd on a reclaimed surface mine in southern West Virginia. The DEP's Mike Huff explains. In this valley that once echoed with the sounds of heavy earth-moving machinery extracting coal from beneath the surface, a new sound, the trumpeting of elk, will soon reverberate through these hills. Two dozen elk, 12 bulls and 12 cows, brought in from western Kentucky, are the foundation of what state officials hope is the beginning of West Virginia's new herd. It has been a long time coming and it has it is a reflection of the hard work of a lot of people, both financially and with just labor, and in many, many instances, a labor of love. Legislation in 2015 authorized the Division of Natural Resources to begin an active elk restoration plan. The state partnered with the Conservation Fund to acquire more than 32,000 acres of publicly accessible land for wildlife management and recreation. The DNR also recently acquired an additional 10,000 acres to add to the Elk Zone, which is spread across Logan, McDowell, Mingo, and Lincoln counties. The Tomlin Wildlife Management Area features a mix of habitat types that include forested valleys and previously surface-mined ridgetops that have been reclaimed to wildlife habitat. And I think that's a, an exciting thing, you know, as you can see here, you know, with thousands of acres here that's been restored, you know, to have the upper population here for people to come and enjoy and, and possibly one day hunt down the road, but uh, I think it's putting the land to good use. Hundreds of people showed up for the ceremony celebrating the return of the elk to the state, and it's that degree of interest that has state officials excited about the potential boost for West Virginia's growing tourism industry. As you can see with all the people around here today, a lot of excitement. And I think you know, having this uh, elk uh, herd back in West Virginia is something positive for southern West Virginia. It'll bring uh, tourists in, hopefully cause a little bit of an uptick in our economy in southern West Virginia. So it's a very exciting day in, in Logan and Mingo counties in West Virginia today. West Virginia's elk restoration program is modeled after similar efforts in several eastern states. After traveling from Kentucky, the elk herd spent some time in this large holding pen getting used to their new surroundings before being released to roam the West Virginia hills. In addition to this herd, state wildlife officials hope to bring in additional elk from out of state over the coming years. In Logan County, I'm Mike Huff for Environment Matters. The DNR hopes that the herd will have grown large enough to allow limited hunting in the next five to 10 years. As your holiday lights go up this year, your electric bill doesn't have to. That's the message behind the DEP's annual energy tree display. The display allows visitors to provide the power using a hand crank to light up a traditional 100 bulb incandescent tree or an 800 plus bulb 35 foot LED tree draped to the side of the DEP headquarters building in Charleston. By turning the crank, visitors can better understand the difference in the amount of electrical energy it takes to light up each tree. At my house, we have six sets of LEDs we burn for 12 hours a day for 30 days. And with LEDs, that costs you about $1.75 in electricity costs. If we were burning the same amount of incandescence, um, the traditional type Christmas lights, we would be paying over $10 to burn them the same amount of time. So that's, I mean, it doesn't sound like a lot of money, but if you can change out the lights in your house, and they're definitely becoming more affordable now. So, um, you know, you can, you can save a lot of money and save the environment, which is really what we're trying, the message we're trying to get across to people. The event also showcased some of the Division of Air Quality's other energy-related displays, including a solar racetrack, an energy house, and an indoor version of the crank generator. Air quality staff was also on hand to answer questions. Plus, the big man in the red suit, Santa Claus, stopped by for a visit, much to the delight of the kids. LED lights use 90% less electricity than traditional incandescent lighting and last up to 50,000 hours, and less energy use equals less air pollution. LEDs have come down in price considerably over the last few years, and although they're still more expensive than conventional incandescent lights, since LEDs last much longer, they'll pay for themselves many times over during the life of the bulb. Switching to LEDs isn't the only way to save electricity. Did you know there are several power robbing devices probably plugged in at your home right now? They're called vampires, but don't worry, you don't need garlic, silver bullets, or a sharpened steak to get rid of them.
You'll find them in every room in your house. Some are easy to spot, others are a little better hidden. The problem is called phantom load. Electronic devices that continue to use small amounts of power even when they're turned off. The average home has about 25 of these little blood suckers. Probably the most common offender is this, your cell phone charger. You unplug your phone when you leave your house, but as long as the charger is plugged into the wall, it's draining power, even though your phone is not charging. But that's not the biggest vampire in your house. Computers and all the various devices like printers and routers and external hard drives all consume power even when they're in standby. Cable boxes, TVs, and sound systems are other sources. Basically, any device that has a clock or a remote control is drawing a small amount of power all the time. The easiest way to reduce vampire power loss is to use a power strip and turn the power off when you're not using it. It's estimated that between 5 and 25 percent of your total electric use comes from this phantom load. We leave you now along the marshes of the Ohio River in Mason County on a chilly winter afternoon. On behalf of all of us at the West Virginia Department of Environmental Protection, thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. More than 800 people with one mission, promoting a healthy environment. We are the West Virginia Department of Environmental Protection.